you looking to up your real estate investing game? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Sub 2 Deal Show with your host, Sub 2 expert, William Tingle. Hey, Sub 2ers. My name is William Tingle of Sub2Deals.com. And I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the Sub 2 Deal Show, where we talk about all things subject to. Occasionally, we'll cover other real estate topics, but will always be something to help you with your real estate investing business. Today's episode is part one of a two-part podcast with Scott Moyes. Scott is a longtime investor uh, who spoke to my Sub2 Deals coaching group about doing joint venture partnerships using title holding trusts. Scott explains how to use these trusts to avoid due on sale issues, partner with other investors and private money lenders, and also avoid other potential problems commonly found when either renting or selling a property. Now, don't miss part two of this podcast where Scott will do a Q&A with my students following his presentation. If you're interested in learning more about our private coaching group, you can learn more at sub2deals.com. Just click on the consulting tab at the top of the page, then click on group coaching. And now here's Scott Moyes, uh, discussing joint venture partnerships using title holding trusts. Scott uh, Boys, uh, tell us a little about yourself and then tell us about the title holding trust and how we can use that to protect ourselves, our sellers, our buyers, and our partners uh, with uh, joint ventures and trusts. Great, thanks, William. I, I've, uh, we've crossed paths uh, over the years and uh, talked with some of the same people, been on some of the same forums and so on. So. It's finally good to uh, uh, formally meet you, and and we had a nice chat the other day, so uh, that was that was nice. I uh, I'm I'm known as the full price offer guy and the smart REI. In fact, I run the national smart RIA, and uh, and and I only make full price offers on properties, guys. I I don't dicker, I don't hassle, I don't negotiate. I will only offer you a full price. Period. So, um, and I never pay more than $10 for a property. So those are kind of my little bylines that usually uh, <laughs> sparks some interest in a few people. So, but today we're gonna specifically uh, address, and we're just maybe not a real formal presentation, but we're just gonna walk through a, uh, an outline that I formed for William um, and kind of lead up to the crescendo of, of how to JV with people. So. And, and honestly, uh, the whole arrangement is a JV agreement anyway, from beginning to end. So um, we'll just kind of get started. Some of you have this in front of you, so we'll just kind of follow it. So first of all, um, let's talk about what is a, a joint venture. And I just kind of wrote up my definition of it. Uh, some of you have this maybe in front of you. It says it's, it's an arrangement between two or more parties where each party contributes something and uh, maybe towards uh, a process or project and hoping to make a profit. Okay? That's kind of my own little definition I came up with real quick. Uh, maybe it's not exact, but that's, it, it's my presentation, okay? So um, anyway, so how do we, uh, why do you use a joint venture? Um, more importantly, most people think it's just about money, but a lot of times in my case, um, I offer my knowledge and my uh, know-how. I've been doing this for a long time and so, as you might guess, I get a lot of people that call me and say, hey, can you help walk us through this? It's not necessarily about the money, although that could be part of it, certainly. And of course, uh, joint venture partners can offer also credit and the other things that we'll talk about here. So um, why do you do a joint venture? Well, because you don't have the knowledge. And uh, how do you find these people? Well, you can talk with other investors. That's where most people think uh, that I can think of that that when they think of a joint venture partner, they're thinking of money, so that would be another investor. And they could be using things like uh, uh, just their own cash, uh, write you a check, they could be private or hard money lenders, they could be uh, come from their uh, self-directed IRAs or 401ks, that's the one I prefer. Uh, one of these days we may talk about solo 401ks. Um, I partner a lot with tired landlords, and I find them uh, through the eviction notices. Um, we're going to talk to, I'm going to show you a case study about a tired landlord that I ran into uh, here at the end. So um, how about the sellers themselves? Can they JV with you? Sure, absolutely. I mean, this is a sub two group. Is the seller not partnering with you? Isn't, aren't they JVing with you? 
by contributing something to the transaction? Yeah, they're contributing their property and possibly even equity, okay? So you can JV with the seller. Um, you might find that, uh, let's say it's a seller that's not their personal residence that they're moving out of. Maybe it's an investor uh, that has a couple of rental properties. And the problem with investors with rental properties, especially in the higher end, is when they sell those, they may have some tax issues. They may have a tax problem. And instead of paying all these uh, taxes, the it, when we talk about the trust, as they become a beneficiary of the trust, their interest in the trust is treated like real estate for the purpose of 1031 exchange. So we can delay or, pr or, or prolong the uh, period that they may have to pay taxes on or uh, be able to find another property or like kind of exchange. So it really has uh, uh, a lot of other purposes besides just taking a property subject too, okay? So uh, how about agents? I've partnered with agents where they've actually contributed their commissions as a, as a JV partner in the transaction, right? Because maybe the, the buyer needed a little bit extra money to come in and pay closing costs, that kind of thing. So the agent can contribute to that and they become a JV partner. Now they can become a partner. Any of your partners can, uh, you can do it many ways. You can create notes, of course, and uh, where they might charge you points and interest like some of you used to with your uh, hard and private money loans. Um, but they can be your JV partner, not just your lender, not just your hard or private money lender. And it's much more beneficial and safer for them to do that. So where do you find these people? Well, of course, anytime everybody asks me how to get started in anything, I tell them the first thing to do is join your local RIA because you're going to find people there that do things that maybe you want to do. You can ask them, hey, listen, can I bird dog for you? Can I follow you? Can I sit in your office or come to your home and watch you work for the day? Um, uh, you, can, you can find them in your RIA. And a lot of those folks, that's how I got started, is I talked to somebody at a local RIA, asked them how they were doing things and uh, started following them around and learned how to do what I do today, okay? So again, your local RIA and social media. Look, we're here today because I found William on social media. Um, I'd probably do a couple deals, maybe every couple months, where I have found somebody that wanted my knowledge to JV on a deal off of social media. I was the JV partner, okay? So, um, go to all those other seminars and events that we just talked about that people aren't going to these days. But when you hear about them, if they're, you know, after we get through with this Corona thing and uh, the virus thing, uh, you get some physical uh, events and that kind of thing, you go meet people, right? A lot of times I just participated in a, in one this morning out of Boise, Idaho, where it was just a, everybody just socializing, uh, talking about themselves and, and what we do uh, in this business. And uh, already I have a mortgage guy, a couple of agents, and two or three investors that have emailed me saying, hey, can you help us on these deals? So again, I'm the JV partner on those. And actually they are too. They just don't know it yet because they're going to contribute something, their knowledge. I don't need their money, but their knowledge. I need their knowledge. I need their referrals. I think a referral is a, a good thing you can get from a JV partner, okay? especially from agents, CPAs, and so on. CPAs, because you might have these folks that have commercial properties or large uh, 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 rental properties, whether it's multifamily or single family, doesn't matter. They want out of these, they want to retire. And then they just want cash flow. They don't want to manage properties. They don't want to pay a property manager anymore. And by doing what I'm going to show you, we can just give them cash flow and they don't ever have to worry about a property ever again. Okay. So, and they have money coming out of those deals, which they can roll over like a tax deferred exchange would be into trust and just cash flow instead of manage the property or pay for property managers. Okay. So what are the, the pros and cons of JVing? Well, um, the pro of course, is you get somebody with knowledge, money, or credit. If we talked about before the cons, I know there's a lot of pro, uh, documents out there that you can duplicate or get for free somewhere. But typically, they're a little complicated, in my opinion. I think they're a lot more complicated than what I'm going to show you. But they're a little complicated. They can be costly depending on if their attorney gets involved. I always hate that. Attorneys are deal killers, right? So when their get, attorney gets involved, now you got cost and now you got all these unnecessary questions, in my opinion, and, and so on. And the attorney can potentially just kill the deal or tell them it's not good for them. 
Um, and your partner, your JV partner, your, whether they're hard or private money or they're just lending you money or giving you money for the deal, they may want to be in some kind of a first position, uh, which tends to complicate things because now they're entitled to the property. God forbid you don't ever want to put anybody on property title, ever. Not even in contracts for deed and all-inclusive trust deeds and things like that. You just don't want to do it. And you'll understand why. So, and your partner, of course, if they're in that kind of a position, they're going to have some serious recourse if the deal you put together and you don't follow through. Of course, if you don't follow through, you deserve what you get. But uh, if you don't follow through or the deal falls through, they've got all this recourse typically against you, uh, especially if they're in position like first position or so on. Okay. So, so what we're going to talk about is really the ultimate safe and legal alternative. I want to come back to that word alternative here in a minute. It's the only safe and legal alternative that I know of uh, to structure uh, a subject to, especially with a JV that protects all the parties involved um, without having to do notes if you don't want to. Uh, there, there are some times where you can do a note, but, um, and it's very easy to set up, very easy to create, very easy to use. Um, all the process uh, is done for you, all documentation, accounting, legal, the whole bit. Uh, I know we had somebody from New York on your group here, uh, was it this morning? It all runs together, right? Last couple of days, we're all stuck in our homes. Um, that was looking at trying to do a deal in New York and was looking for an attorney in New York. Um, not saying that you shouldn't have an attorney, but just remember they're deal killers. And especially when it comes to these types of transactions, especially trusts, I've known very, very few attorneys uh, that know really anything about trust other than to complete the cookie cutter form for their family living trust. They know very, very little if anything about title holding land trust. And of course, uh, Unfortunately, some people have used those types of things to, uh, as I say, forgive my language, screw and tattoo people. And so now these attorneys are saying, ah, psh, don't do that. You don't want to do any one of those things. And the only reason they really are, are, are let's say, bad mouthing or poo-pooing all over this idea of using a land trust is because they can't do it. They don't know how to draft it. They don't know where to get it. Um, they're unfamiliar with it. And of course, as you know, unfamiliarity breeds no braids doubt okay so i do uh i do workshops with attorneys and agents and kind of try to educate them a little bit um sometimes i tick them off and sometimes uh, i'm successful at educating them a little bit so um <clears throat> so anyway and it also allows you to uh, uh all, all the all the costs of doing this kind of thing are all covered by your in buyer or your incoming resident in a sub two transaction it doesn't cost us anything to do this well i'll take that back and you'll see at the end it cost me 10 bucks so and you maintain full control of the uh, of the property and the documentation process and your jv uh partner you don't have to worry about them coming back and saying i want my money out now or there's ways to prevent that or uh very few if any of these transactions doing this kind of thing ever fail um, I, like I said, I've been doing this a long time. I've probably been involved with uh, somewhere between three and 500 transactions. And personally, I've only had to start uh, maybe a half a dozen evictions, for example. Um, and uh, maybe I only had to complete two of those. And because there is tremendous positive exit strategies uh, when you use one of these uh, processes documentation with the title holding trust that uh, other uh, methods don't have. Uh, or can't offer um, and I'm sure I'll share that with you here in a minute too so um, so what are the profit centers of this type of transaction well all the same profit centers that you've always had in all your sub two transactions the same thing um, you might have uh, 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 equity you might acquire some equity you might actually bump the equity which I'll show you here in a minute an example um, you might get upfront cash of course monthly cash flow that's to you and your JV partners. And, uh, and then you might uh, share in the equitable growth appreciation and even note reduction on somebody else's mortgage. Have you ever thought about that one? That you could share a note reduction of somebody else's mortgage? It comes out to be really nice the longer the period goes, right? Um, 
So, and again, you can also structure it as a promissory note within the trust if you'd like to. If they like points and they want interest, you can structure it that way, but all with inside the trust structure. So, so how does this all work? <clears throat> well, let's talk about money because that's what most of us think when we talk about a JV partner is, is money. So, uh, so with regard to funding, a JV partner, what they do is they actually don't make an investment. We got to be careful with the words we use too. I never use the word buyer, never use the word down payment, never talk about interest rates, and I never uh, talk about investment. Our JV partners, whatever they're contributing is exactly that. It's a refundable contribution to the trust. Very simple. They just make a refundable contribution to the trust and their return of or return on investment is all spelled out in a very simple beneficiary agreement. Now what's great about the trust and, and people ask, why do you use a trust? So we don't have to trust them and they don't have to trust us. How's that? Real simple explanation because the property can't be sold, dispersed, whatever, um, without unanimous consent, written consent by all the beneficiaries. We can't do anything different than what we agreed to. And the, the property remains there until it's either sold or refinanced by our resident or just sold outright to a new buyer. And then everything by, con so I know that in, uh, Years ago, I did a couple of JV agreements outside of it, and uh, there were some questions and arguments over when and if, and how come they weren't getting this and that, and they wanted increases, and we need to sell the property now because I want my money back now, that kind of thing. So this eliminates uh, eliminates all that. Um, I did a couple, I, I, I wrote in these notes, but I actually uh, put a picture of a property I've been working on in there. I don't know if you, uh, have that in front of you. Um, but so this, this house is actually out in Utah. Um, it's where I'm at out uh, in the Salt Lake Valley. So this property is actually one of three properties that a tired landlord gave me. And I mean, gave me. So the first property, I actually uh, 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 flipped it, if you will, with the trust. Now, I use the term flip really loosely. So the owner seller i jv'd with him and we had the property placed in a trust he named me a beneficiary of the trust and then we wrote a simple letter to the trustee to sell the property to our end buyer which was basically a wholesale flip so i never had to do double or simultaneous closings i never had to bring in a cash investor i never had to uh, use anybody's credit we just told the trustee to sell the property and distribute the proceeds. I end up with eight grand. The end buyer ended up with the property and the seller got rid of his piece of garbage property that he had been doing a lease option on, right? The same owner, I did the same, I, I did the entire trust agreement of, that you're gonna see here in front of you with these two other properties. So this property, and you'll notice that um, I did a diagram and for those of you uh, you can see I draw circles pretty well in this, in this picture, if you're looking at it. And uh, that was, uh, uh, I probably learned that from my old multi-level days. <laughs> um, a friend of mine taught me how to draw circles when I was really young in Amway. So I, I like to draw circles because I'm, I'm a very visual guy. And uh, so this is a diagram of actually this property that you're seeing in this picture if you got this these documents or this uh, this outline so let me let me do this so here we go we have this tired landlord and what does he contribute well he contributes the property he also contributes by agreeing to leave all of his equity in place for up to five years now why did he agree to leave his equity in place because if he didn't he's going to be taxed big time and if he sold the property outright, even at his asking price of 231000 um, he's probably, I, I asked him, okay, if you sold this thing for full price to a cash buyer right now for two, 231 what are you going to yield at the closing table? He's like, well, uh, 60000 I'm like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, this is real estate. And no wonder you want to get out of it because you don't know anything about it. Right? 
if you, if you sell this right now, you're going to lose about 10% if you sell it for full price. Well, he'd already had offers for 200, 220. Um, and so he's not only going to just lose 10% on 231, he'd lose up to 10% on, on even a lower price. So here I am, full price offer guy he says, look, Mike, I'll offer you your full 231 if you'll leave your, all your equity in place and wait for it later. In the meantime, we can find uh, a property for you to exchange into to just get cash flow maybe in the future, which gave them all another three to five years, three years to figure this out, right? So what I ended up offering though actually was 234. And the reason is because he agreed to pay for new carpet and paint. So what did he contribute again? He contributed his house, his equity, and he agreed to pay for the carpet and the paint, which is three or 4,000 bucks. What I contributed was my knowledge. And what I also contributed, if, if you see this thing, it's pretty small, is I contributed bumped equity. So I bumped the value of the property by $5,000, which guarantees me a $5,000 profit minimum at the end. So that's my contribution. And then the resident coming into the property, we'll talk about them later. We understand there's two types of interests in a trust or in these types of trusts. There's your ownership or beneficial interest. And there's your equitable interest, which is dollars. So Mike's equitable interest is the actual equity in his property. So now it's not only protected by the property, but it's also protected by trust. And guaranteed that's the amount he's going to get when the property is either sold or refinanced. Okay. My interest in the ownership interest in the trust, I, I, I offer to acquire 90% interest in the trust. The seller remains a beneficiary, which is required in order for them not to violate their due on sale provisions of their mortgage contract, right? So I hold 90%. And honestly, it doesn't matter what percent of, the, of interest you, you hold in the beginning, because no other beneficiary can maybe outvote or gang up with the others to do something to another one or sell off their interest or steal their equity or steal their house. So it has to be unanimous. So anyway, two types of interest, beneficial and equitable. And uh, then we bring in our other JV partner, which is our residents. What do they contribute? They contribute the money. They make the payments. They have to agree to be 100% responsible for the property over the term. They have to do all the maintenance, the upkeep, the repairs, pay all the taxes and insurance in the form of a net lease or net occupancy and possessory agreement. Can you do a net lease in a residential property? Absolutely. But if you don't do it inside the trust, the IRS will consider that a sell. And now you've got a sell that's been done at that point and they could probably have, like Mike could have tax problems right? He, he would lose his right for a 1031 tax deferred exchange. So you got to be very, very careful about requiring. Um, and those of you that know me, if you've ever read my lease option horror story, that was one of the five requirements or five things that you can't do. You can't have a uh, resident do any maintenance, upkeep or repairs, or uh, it's considered a sale of the property, especially things like lease options, lease purchase, that kind of thing. Uh, even if they have two separate documents, it doesn't matter. So we won't go into that tonight, but you just got to be careful. So the this snapshot you see uh, and the diagram that I draw on every property that I do, just so I can see it visually and put it into my brain, uh, you can see you put the resident in there. They're going to pay $1,375 a month. Mike's payment is $1,025, so which our cash flow is $350. Mike was, Mike was making $200 a month on his lease option before he kicked people out and I took over the property. So I agreed to keep giving him $200 a month. You can see the trust. Our mutually agreed value is 239, of which 60,000 of it is Mike's, five is mine. And the money that the resident brings in is not an option deposit or a down payment. Those are words you have to eliminate from your vocabulary when you do this kind of transaction, okay? You don't want this to be considered a sale or you're in trouble. So they made a contribution of 8,365 bucks, which covered our, our profit and covered all the costs of trust setup, et cetera. So again, back to the, the, the cash flow. So our cash flow is 350. 
Mike, the settlor beneficiary, that SB there, he still gets 200 a month and he doesn't ever have to worry about the property. Why? Because the property is self-managed. The resident has to be 100% responsible for the property. They cannot call in the middle of the night and say, I lost my key or the water heater broke. They have to take care of it. And for that, the IRS will look through the trust, treat the resident as the owner of the property, and they are allowed to receive all the fee simple bundle of rights of real estate ownership, just as if they bought it, bought it with a mortgage or paid cash. Is that not cool or what? How would you like to be able to give renters active tax write off and all the fee simple bundle of rights of ownership for renting? Pretty awesome. And you know why you would do that? Because that renter now will pay premium rent for that right. Because they were previously renting, let's say, for a thousand a month. Did you realize a thousand dollar a month house payment, or excuse me, rental payment, is the same as a fifteen hundred dollar a month house payment in the lowest tax brackets? You're virtually getting, if you're renting for a thousand, and you're in a thirty percent tax bracket between tank and federal, and I don't have to explain this to everybody, but you guys understand. Mm -hmm. It's the same as making a fifteen hundred dollar a month house payment. So if I'm asking for twelve fifty or thirteen seventy five in this case, and they say, well, yeah, we were really only hoping to pay maybe, you know, twelve hundred, a little bit more than what we were renting for. Um, I don't know if we can do thirteen seventy five. Well, let me ask you a question. If I was able to get you a five hundred dollar a month raise, could you afford the payment? Huh? What? And that's one of the reasons I prefer only working with people that have owned homes before, because they understand the tax benefits. They can go to their employer and adjust their withholding and, and get virtually another $500 a month in their paycheck or pretty close. And if they will pay, in this case, an extra 375, I get to keep the other 125. Or they get to keep 125 in their pocket more than they had the month before, and they have a house, right? So um, anyway, so I, I virtually was cash flowing this house at 150 a month myself. And this was a five-year deal. Well, Here's what happened, <laughs> as sometimes does. Doesn't happen very often, but sometimes does. The folks that were in this property was a Brady Bunch family. They were in there probably eight months, uh, nine months, and they decided that their Brady Bunch wasn't great, and they decided they wanted to get divorced. Nice couple, very cordial with each other, no problems. Um, so, but they wanted to know of their no, uh, of their refundable contribution to the trust, and it has to be refundable, how much of that could they get back? Well, I told them, look, I'll try to get you as much of it as I can, and what do I mean by try? Uh, all I did is I went out and sold their interest in the trust and put somebody else in the property. And I got 12 grand up front from the next guy. Now, the trust and all the setup was already done. Only cost me 250 to do that, $250. And I was able to give these folks back 7500 because the other difference was a monthly payment. So I gave them back 7500 bucks, put the difference in my pocket, and that's this information below here. So a, a couple of years went by. Glenn, who's the guy that got in the property after that, now what's Glenn contributing? Yeah, he's a JV partner. He's now the new resident. He's contributing more money. He's contributing a higher monthly payment. So I got an extra $100 a month. We put the current value up to 270 because that's what the fair market uh, comps came up to, right? And he stayed in that property for oh, about two years. He did not choose to exercise his right. He got transferred to Las Vegas with his employer. And so he has the first right to sell or refinance the place. So that's what we did is we sold the place. At that point, that's when I got my $5,000 back out. This, the, uh, my JV partner, hired landlord, got his 60. The resident came in with their, like I said, I got a total of 12 from him, 12,777 bucks, right? Of which 9450 was refundable. But we had raised his rent. He knew that the, it was an adjustable mortgage, so he knew the payment was going to go up. But instead of raising his payment, we actually tacked it on to the end, like a forbearance type of thing, right? And so uh, he ended up getting back at uh, 
when we sold the house. We sold it for 305. Okay. Um, Mike ended up making an extra 8,400 bucks in cash flow. I made an extra another 6,804 dollars in cash flow. And uh, so when we sold the house, the sellers, which is us, the trust, got 116 grand, 117 grand. Mike got his 60 grand plus the return on investment that I promised him. He got a total of 75,898. And all the cash to me at termination, when this thing sold, I made another 36 to 36, six. I got my 6804 in cash flow. I made six grand up front. And that doesn't include the extra that I got out of Glenn up front on the second transaction. All my cash back to my resident was 510 bucks. And as you can see here, this thing cost me a total, total of $10. Remember, I'm the full price offer guy and I never pay more than $10 to control a property. Somebody else paid for it, not me. And yet I JV'd with each one of those folks. If you go back and look at this, and then we'll take questions here. What if this, uh, this diagram, it wasn't a tired landlord? What if it was a property that I found that I needed 60 grand to convince the seller to leave their financing in place or less? Maybe I only needed 40, but I could promise my JV partner 60. And then their contribution to the trust is 60. And when the house sells, that 60 goes to them for their $40,000 contribution. Now, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people that would love to have, let's say, that kind of a return on and of their investment over a three-year period. Where can you go today other than real estate? to invest that kind of money and get that kind of return. And we can adjust this any way we want. And think about this, think about what Mike got out of this. He got full price for his house, no commissions, no closing costs, got his $60,000 out, plus a $15,000 bonus and $200 a month for three and a half years. How many JV partners would like that kind of a deal? Now, I don't exactly have them knocking my doors down, but I get calls all the time from hard and private money people that normally would just charge points and interest and that are willing to leave their uh, financing with me. It's not even financing, it's a contribution, right? For more than just 12 months. And I don't have to pay upfront points. Now, if I wanted to pay upfront points, guess what? I would just give them a piece of whatever the resident's bringing in upfront. Maybe that would count as points. So you kind of get the idea, right? Uh, well, sub tours, that is it for an, this episode of the sub two deals show podcast. You can find the show notes for this episode, along with a complete transcript at sub two podcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it. If you would subscribe, please give us a five star rating and review on Apple podcasts. It only takes a minute and it helps others discover the show. You can subscribe as well as leave a rating and review by visiting Apple Podcasts and just do a quick search for the Sub2 Deal Show. It'd also be great if you would consider sharing our podcast with a fellow real estate investor who you think may benefit from it. And finally, if you haven't yet, you can join our absolutely free Facebook Subject 2 group at sub2forum.com. You can also get lots more resources to help you grow your real estate investing business at sub2deals.com. So until our next show, keep learning, keep talking to sellers, and you will buy some houses. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Sub 2 Deal Show with William Tingle. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit sub2deals.com and on Facebook at Sub 2 Deals. We'll catch you next time.